Good afternoon and welcome to Midweek Connection. We are here at First Presbyterian Church in San Angelo and I am Pastor Natalie. And I'm Pastor Joel. And we're going to do what we normally do, right? And uh, we're going to change it up a little bit this morning and, or this afternoon. And so um, we're going to read through the lectionary and I'm going to open us in a word of prayer this afternoon. Heavenly Father, Thank you for this time together, and thank you for your words to us, and I pray that as we hear these words today, that they speak to us, and that we hear them, and that um, we grow closer to you through your word to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And I will start with Psalm 15. O oh Lord, who may abide in your tent? who may dwell on your holy hill, those who walk blamelessly and do what is right and speak the truth from their heart, who do not slander with their tongue and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors, in whose eyes the wicked are despised, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath even to their hurt, who do not lend money at interest and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. And Psalm 147, verses 1 through 11. Praise the Lord, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the animals their food and to the young ravens when they cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the speed of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. And now we'll read from Isaiah, beginning in chapter 63, verse 15. Look down from heaven and see from your holy and glorious habitation. Where are your zeal and your might? The yearning of your heart and your compassion, they are withheld from me. For you are our father, though Abraham does not know us and Israel does not acknowledge us. You, O Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from of old is your name. Why, O Lord, do you make us stray from your ways and harden your heart so that we do not fear you? Turn back for the sake of your servants, for the sake of the tribes that are your heritage. Your holy people took possession for a little while, but now our adversaries have trampled down your sanctuary. We have long been like those whom you do not rule, like those not called by your name. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence as when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God beside you who works for those who wait for him. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry, and we sinned, because you hid yourself, we transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people. Our epistle reading today comes from 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-16. through 16. The saying is sure, whoever aspires to the office of bishop desires a noble task. Now a bishop must be above reproach, married only once, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, an apt teacher, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, and not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, keeping his children submissive and respectful in every way. 
For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may be puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace and the snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be serious, not double-tongued, not indulging in much wine, not greedy for money. They must hold fast to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, and let them first be tested. Then, if they prove themselves blameless, let them serve as deacons. Women, likewise, must be serious, not slanderers, but temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be married only once, and let them manage their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and great boldness in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you so that, if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and bulwark of the truth. Without any doubt, the mystery of our religion is great. He was revealed in flesh, vindicated in spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among Gentiles, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. And our gospel reading is from Mark chapter 11, verses 27 through chapter 12, verse 12. Again they came to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven? Or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin? They were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus answered them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. Then he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent another slave to them, this one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, and others they killed. He had still one another, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him, sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing to our eyes. When they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him and went away. Switching back to the Psalms, uh, we are going to read Psalm 48. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevations, the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled. They came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic. They took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, pains as of a woman in labor as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion, go all around it, count its towers, consider well its ramparts, go through its citadels, that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. 
And our final psalm today is Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God of my right. You gave me room when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. How long, you people, shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? But know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. When you are disturbed, do not sin. Ponder it on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when their grain and wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace. For you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Where do you want to start today? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. Uh... I was thinking, actually, even, uh, I know that we frequently do 147, 1 mm -hmm. through 11, and, and obviously it's a very familiar, these first 11, since we do it often on Wednesday, but right. um, just thinking again about uh, how good it is to sing praises to our God, for he is gracious and a song of praise is fitting. Um, you know, when we think about God, we often think of his, his power, his righteousness, his justice, his judgments, um, maybe even sometimes his wrath and things. Um, but uh, here, it's, it's, he is, is gracious. Uh, a song of praise is fitting. And, and, I, and I wonder if, if, we, if we remember to read all of these texts today in that sense of God being a gracious God, and just kind of maybe let that inform us as, as we read today. Uh, because, you know, you jump over to Isaiah and Isaiah 63, it's, it's right towards the, the end of a rather lengthy, you know, uh, prophecy. Isaiah 66 chapters. And so starting in verse 63 and going through almost the end of 64, um, this is in the section of Isaiah when he speaks more about the restoration of the people of God and how they had done things that were disturbing and disappointing and unrighteous and unfaithful and all those things. They had spent time in exile. God is prophesying through Isaiah that there's going to be re uh, restoration. You know, the penitence that they pray and that God actually comes down then um, the beginning of 64, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. Um, and in light of what has happened in, in Turkey and Syria, that border area, and all the, the tens of thousands of people that died in an earthquake, and, and, and we know that you know, there are natural things that occur on the earth. We also know that you know, building codes are, are different in different areas of, of the world. And, right. you know, that a devastating earthquake anywhere, obviously, but because of, um, you know, um, man-made conditions, density of people together in, in buildings that right. are not capable of withstanding earthquakes right. uh, and, and, the, and the people that die. And I think about it here, though, here's... Here's Isaiah, uh, you know, crying out that God would come down and shake the mountains. And how regularly we might could think that uh, mountains are, are, you know, permanent and strong and, and huge and have ascended into heaven. And unmoving. Unmoving, a place where uh, people tend to think they can encounter God on these mountains. And there's this... This, uh, this prophecy that the mountains would shake and that the nations would tremble, that that which to us seems unmovable right. would be moved. And uh, if we think about the oppression that occurs in the world, we think about principalities and powers or whoever might be um, uh, exerting dominance over others unjustly, unrighteously, and things, how 
you know, that's that's on kind of this macro scale things. And, and you know, in, in the United States, we kind of have a hard time thinking about that. We're like, well, we have a representative government, right? We don't have kingdoms. We don't have this. You know, we, we elect our leaders. Um, but maybe even not on the macro level, but on the micro level, what are things in our own lives that are uh, seemingly unshakable mountains of, of difficulty and challenges that we might face? And how might we be expecting God to show up in the midst of that? You know, um, I don't know if you can tell on the phone, uh, but I'm I'm in a little bit of physical pain right now, and it, it hurts. And and I just think, oh Lord, just let the pain go away. Um, but you know, a couple of weeks of inconvenience currently for me is nothing compared to. Yes. years and years and years of oppression that people would have felt they might not have been in physical pain or they could have even been in physical pain but just the emotional uh, depth of their suffering uh, the seeming um, inability for uh, for righteousness to truly prevail and and here's God saying I'm gonna come set this to right and you can right. trust me in this Right, and then, you know, as we get into chapter 64 and you talk about, you know, no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you for you have hidden your face. They have this, this feeling that they somehow have been separated from God, but yet he is, he is answering. But they are calling out, so they recognize that that presence is still there. Right. Um, you know, we talked a little bit earlier, but here is that reference that um, we are the clay and you are the potter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked earlier but um uh you know what does that really mean when you think about a potter shaping and forming and it's the clay doesn't have any control mm -hmm. and so when we ask god to come in and shape us and form us um there's a trust aspect there and sometimes that can be difficult and sometimes that can be um maybe even frustrating because we may have something in mind and Maybe that's not what God has for us. Mm -hmm. And so um, this idea that we are ready to be shaped and formed and that he is in control, um, I think we say that sometimes, but I think the reality of that can sometimes be difficult to um, allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Like, do we really trust that God is the potter that is shaping us? Do we really trust that God... Uh, is working for our good in the midst of, of difficult circumstances and things. And uh, when we were talking earlier, the Sunday text, one of the Sunday Psalms is, is Psalm 2. Mm -hmm. And this is where, again, it's talking about when, when God comes in his glory, the king that he is setting on Zion is going to dash the potter's vessels with a rod of iron. And so even here, it's uh, we are being shaped by God, but not just us like all of the world is being shaped right. by God um, every person is in in the hands of God and God is the master uh, uh, potter you know the one who will shape all of the clay for his purposes and we might not fully understand uh, everything that's going on like if we jump back over to Timothy uh, clearly here in this passage Paul is giving out the qualifications for being a bishop and a deacon um, and, and even in the midst of having you know very appropriate guidelines right you know these are these are kind of again uh, as we talked on Sunday kind of the bare minimum requirements of, of being an elder or for being a deacon um, you know it's just kind of nice uh, you know temperate sensible respectable hospitable apt teacher not drunkard not, uh, not violent but gentle not quarrelsome not a lover of money um, managing their own household well, all those kind of things. Um, but again, these are, in my understanding, kind of the bare minimum qualities. Like right. what, what then, after these uh, boxes have been checked, what more does God require of elders? And this is not totally laid out here in these passages. And I think right. sometimes people have used these to say, oh, well, I'm qualified because I do all these things. But do they truly understand what elders are called to do? Uh, what deacons then might be called to do um, in their in their office? And I'm trying to remember exactly the point I was trying to make with that. But um, being that God is the Potter 
and is transforming us into the people he wants us to be. Here are here are bare minimum shape, right? You know, right. This vessel could be a good elder, but then if it just sits on the shelf and does nothing, then you know that pitcher that's pour, you know, supposed to pour water. But right. if it just sits on the shelf and does nothing, well, it has all the qualifications right. of being the pitcher. It's got a spout, it's got a handle, it's got a you know place to hold the stuff. But unless it's actually doing, that's what it's supposed to do. And right. it's not actually fulfilling its function. So God not only shapes us to be the people he wants us to be, but then we have that responsibility to actually act into the role that God is calling us to do. Right. I think that's the point I was trying to make with that. Well, if it wasn't, it was good. <laughs> 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 Whatever that's worth. But, but, yeah, right, no, right. I think that, um, you know, and, and yes, those of you that joined us on Sunday, you know, know, Joel did speak about that. You know, there's these basic requirements, you know, and, uh, you know, you look at Old Testament law, you know, and it's don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Okay, you know, so I must be a good person. But there's a lot of things that you can do that don't break those laws. There's a lot of things that you may not be these things, but if, if the Spirit's not there, if that, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, there's, requirements and then there's living into mm. and accepting and um, well, I think that's a good segue into even the Mark passage uh, end of 11 and into 12 um, you know there's there are the people that have the outward signs of, of leadership you know mm -hmm. they are the you know in this particular place it's the chief priests and the scribes and the elders and they come to Jesus, and here, here again, they they have the uh, uh, the the authority has been granted to them by the people, and then but the difference is they they instead of coming along and welcoming Jesus and worshiping Jesus, there's the questioning of the authority. So they look the part, but they are not doing their job. They are not giving glory to the King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And so the parable that's told in, in chapter 12 regarding the wicked tenants, it's God put people in the vineyard to do what? To grow the grapes and then to give those grapes then to the owner of the vineyard. That right. is their purpose. That's the right. whole reason why they are there, to actually do that which they've been you know, essentially shaped and molded to do. Right. And then they don't. They end up, you know, killing and beating and shaming all the servants, and ultimately the master sends his son, and they do the same. And so in verse 12, when it says, they realized that Jesus had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowd, so they left him one away. And so there's, they, they, they're acknowledging it. Here's, here's, the, here's the creator of the universe, the, the, the master potter, the planter of the vineyard, we have been called to this purpose. We are not doing this purpose. Um, well, then what good are they? Right. Well, it's, it's so ironic to me when you look at the Pharisees and the scribes and these elders. You know, they, they knew Old Testament. They knew the laws. They knew the commands. They studied this. They, they proclaimed that they were following this and that they were followers of God because you know they were leaders in the church and yet you have the son of god in front of you you have this and instead of recognizing that and in and, and living into that they have somehow elevated themselves above him mm -hmm. they have taken mm -hmm. and said you know we follow this law better than anybody else could follow this law and therefore, who do you, who gave you this authority? Who do you think you are to somehow um, come in here and tell us that we're not doing this right? When by all outward appearances, they are following right. the laws, they are right. doing the religious things, but their heart is so hard, and their hearts are so turned away from what God calls us to do, and then. Like you said, they recognize it. They know that this parable is told about them. But it doesn't and need instead to of right, instead of them saying, "Oh my goodness, like this is the sun. This is the sun coming to us," and then repenting and and leaning into God, it's how dare him? 
we want to arrest him, but well, there's all these people over here that believe in him and you know they've got power in numbers, so we're just gonna leave this alone for now. Not because they feared God, but because they feared the mob. And so it's just this weird, um, it's always so ironic that they knew the law so well, and yet they didn't understand it. Right. And they didn't understand what God was inviting them into. Right. The, the graciousness of God that we talked about from 147, all of the things that point to him and how do we respond in our own um how do we respond with praise? You know, how do we give him the glory? And and I think that exactly what you just said jumps back to the Psalm four. Uh, you know, how long, starting verse two, how long you people shall my honor suffer shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? And you know, the the psalmist here is 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 channeling like the thoughts of God. Like, right. What, what, what in the world is is going on with people that have been called to a purpose and then don't fulfill it? Um, you know, uh, the, the intro to Psalm 4, you know, it is a Psalm of David. Uh, you know, David, we, we, we understand David had his challenges and his struggles. You know, he, he fell short in so many ways. Uh, but desiring to follow the heart of God, desiring to fulfill his function, to do his job, um, and to do it well. Um, right. Being molded, being shaped into that person, uh, we, need to, we need to fulfill the function for which we have been shaped. Uh, and, and David did that. You know, David wasn't perfect, we know that. But David ruled the people, led the people by pointing them back to God. It was always a point back to God. Um, so for people in the church today, uh, you know, for you and for me, you know, we, uh, I think there's a, uh, you know, there's a high calling on our lives, um, not just because of the positions that we have in church, but because right. we we've been called to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. If, if we are not being transformed, if, if we are not uh, functioning in the way that God will want us to be, um, how can we possibly then call others to do the same? Right. Um, and how can we point others? How can we right. direct people if we are missing the mark ourselves, mm -hmm. if we are not shining that light on Christ, if we are not, um, you know, it, it says it right there, I just, mm, um, maybe it wasn't this song, maybe it was one, uh, let the light of your face shine on us, O Lord, but, but maybe it was somewhere else in another one, but if we're not pointing that light, if we're not shining that light to Christ, and we're not pointing to God, if we aren't living our lives transformed to do that, how in the world can we expect people to see Him? Right. And um, to them as well. Well, and then, and, then with, and then with just, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, regular church attenders that come, people who, who are wanting to take their faith seriously as opposed to just sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning, um, they have opportunities that we will never have. They, right. they know people in their contexts, in their jobs, in their communities, in their families. They have uh, the, uh, that, that same... Um, opportunity and an obligation, you know, right. as a follower of Christ, uh, are are they fulfilling um, their responsibility? And uh, it's it's just it's it's challenging because I think for too long, uh, for too long, Natalie, um, I think churches have just kind of been a oh, it's just a safe place to go and, and rest or see and be seen, whatever it might happen to be, without remembering the the, the mission. Um, and even the intensity of the mission, in a way, it's not—it's not a burden. It's—it's it's a, it's a joy. It's a privilege, uh, but it is a responsibility. You know, how have have our lives really been truly changed? Right. That that we can share what Christ has done for us in the world, and if we if we feel like, well, I don't have anything to share maybe one should reflect upon that and say, well, have you been transformed? Right. Well, and, and with that, I think, too, a lot of people, um, 
um, sit in our churches on Sunday morning and listen to whoever is preaching from the pulpit, you know, typically you, but, and they, they look at that as your job. That's what you do. Mm -hmm. You preach, you teach, you share um, the gospel in, in a way that speaks to people, um, but they somehow think that they can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and yet, you know, Paul says in there um, that, you know, I don't come with fancy words. I don't come with, um, you know, when you look at who Jesus chose as disciples and, and he didn't say, well, I'm going to pick these people and this class of people or this group of people are going to teach. No, he he called the uneducated. He, mm -hmm. he, you know, those were the people he chose and he calls all of us right. into that mission. And so it's not just a mission for the other people to do. And, and you don't have to have fancy words. You don't have to have... Um, Big degrees, degrees right? you don't have to have that. You have to have a heart willing to trust and a heart willing to be transformed. And in that, um, with that being allowed, you know, allowing yourself to be molded and transformed, in that, that boldness and that confidence can come. Right. And, um, and you know, the Spirit will, you know, give you the words. And um, so. No, I. I very much agree. I do believe, like at the end of that uh, First Timothy chapter three passage, uh, you know, Paul is giving specific instructions to Timothy. So in case he doesn't show up, you know, it's written down, which is a blessing right. because now we have those same instructions available to us. But uh, but the idea of the mystery of our religion, in the sense of, I I don't know all of the answers. Right. Um. I don't even know if I know half of the answers you know it's it's there's a lot of mystery in the idea of you know um, God the Father Son Holy Spirit God uh, existing outside of time but entering into time uh, how did God know that humans were going to behave in this certain way how did they plan that God that Jesus was going to come and, and save but uh, all of those, and, th and those are, you know, that's kind of baseline Christianity stuff, you know, right. and then there's there are th the other things. But here's, again, where Paul writes to Timothy, and this verse 16 is just kind of a, uh, you know, formulaic in a will, uh, in a way, could be, um, could be like an early uh, uh, catechism kind of song that might have been told you know he was revealed in flesh vindicated in spirit seen by angels proclaimed among gentiles believed in throughout the world taken up in glory like at the very least can christians know the basics of the faith even though there's mystery even right. though we don't know all of the answers even though we have to be comfortable in saying probably from time to time i, I don't know i don't know the answer to that i don't know the answer to that i'd love to continue to discuss it further i'd right. love to dig into scripture to see if there is a an explanation to your question or at least a way to ask the question differently uh that could even shed light on what the answer might be but basic things you know can we go to anybody and say you know Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so and and to truly believe it and to have a life that's been transformed by that so uh, mystery but responsibility uh, trust that the Holy Spirit is bringing that redemption and healing and wholeness that we need right. um, um, and that uh, that Jesus really did come from heaven as John the Baptist preached right <laughs> And he is the son that came expecting the fruit from the vineyard. Um, I think we should be about the uh, planting and harvesting of grapes. <laughs> right. And then, and then offer it to God right. for his glory. Anything else? I, no. I think that's a good note to end on. Okay. And so would you like to close I us would in like to prayer close in prayer. Yeah, yeah, thanks for leading on us today, Natalie. Yeah. I do appreciate it. Well, let's pray. Uh, gracious Lord, thank you for your word to us today. Uh, thank you for the ways that uh, it seems that every time we, we open your word, there's something new that's been revealed to us, even though it has, uh, these are ancient words, but they are still new to us uh, every morning because your faithfulness is so great. Uh, Lord, I am grateful for uh, Natalie and other leaders in the church that are uh, committed to growing in their own faith and then leading others 
uh, and at the very least pointing others uh, towards Jesus, knowing that there are flaws in our own lives, but as we trust you to work in us and to forgive us and to heal us and to make us whole, uh, that we can be uh, good examples for others, that we can be uh, more adept at uh, explaining some of those mysteries, uh, and at the very least, having great confidence in your graciousness to us, Lord, that even when we fall short and even when we do mess up, that we trust that you will be there with us, loving us and forgiving us, and again, making us whole. Well, we do want to pray for our church and pray for the people in our church here at First Presbyterian San Angelo, uh, that, our, that our, our covenant partners would be about your mission and that they would be about sharing uh, your good news with people who have not yet responded to it in faith. Uh, let us grow, Lord. Let us have revival here. Let revival start with repentance um, and an acknowledgement that we need to be uh, the people in your vineyard um, uh, collecting a good harvest and presented it, presenting it to you in, uh, in, in humble submission, but also in, in the expectation of your goodness to be poured out on us. So Lord, we thank you for this time. Uh, Lord, I do ask that you would uh, remove this pain from me and, and be with other members of our family and friends that are experiencing difficulties, either physically or emotionally or spiritually. Uh, bring healing, Lord. Um, uh, and, and in the midst of uh, the suffering or the struggle, uh, that we would not lose heart and that we would stay confident in you. We thank you and praise you for this time. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye.